We are now in high tide. Actually, high tide is not for another hour and 45 minutes. And you can see um, from here, I'm standing here on the upland right here. This is the salt marsh. Now we still got another hour to go and I'm in water. So we expect that water actually may even be close to the uplands. So these plants really have to get used to living in an environment that floods twice a day and it drains twice a day. If you notice right there, those um, white poles, that's actually where the low tide mark is. So, and um, at low tide, all of this area here is dry and the water actually will be um, right on the other side of those poles. So these plants have to get used to that. They are well adapted to it. The common one here, Spartana, for example, to talk about, this is our common one. It's the one that you see all over the marsh. The way that it adapts to this is that like all plants, they need oxygen. Their roots need oxygen um, to grow. The plants need it. So what Spartina does is that it takes an oxygen through the, the leaves and the stems, push it all the way down to the roots. And that's where they call like um, halophytes. All the plants that live in the marsh have that ability to take the oxygen and push it down into their roots so their plants will have roots when it's flooded because when it's flooded, there's no oxygen in here for the plants to use. So that is one way that they're well adapted. The other thing is that this water is pretty salty. Um, and so all plants need fresh water. So what these um, plants also have to do, they have these specialized cells where when they take in the water, they can extract the salt out of the water so that the plant will have fresh water. And there are certain times of the day when you can actually see when it, um, you can see like little salt crystals on the plant as well. This is actually, this is called smooth cord grass and it's called smooth cord grass because the leaves are pretty smooth. And the reason why it's so dense there is that this plant goes, grows by a rhizome. And you can see this little tiny plant right here. This is actually kind of coming off of the roots. So it's like the grass that's in your yard. You know how dense and lush it is. If you pull that up, you'll notice that it has like a if you pull up the roots, you'll have a whole bunch of plants stuck to it because they're all coming up out of the rhizome. So this, because this is a grass. What I've got here probably doesn't look like much, but as soon as Sandra ta started talking about the salt marsh cord grass and it's important in the estuary, its importance in the estuary, I realized back here that high tide is pushing all this grass up and this is basically just dead cord grass from last year's crop. And what's really neat about this is it's kind of like compost in your garden. This stuff called detritus, or when we see it washed up in the big sheets like this, we call it rack. We spell that W-R-A-C-K. And this starts breaking down and, and um, really gets very um, broken up. And it also is a, it's a great habitat. But it's where our salt marshes and our oceans get a lot of their nutrients, a lot of the healthy things that some of our seafood species need to survive. And it's an important part of the food chain. This is the base of the food chain. If you've ever learned about food chains, we need this kind of stuff for the little tiny critters to eat. And then the bigger things up the food chain eat this. So it doesn't look that exciting or look like much. You'd probably almost think it was kind of trash that you just needed to, to scrape up and get rid of but it's great for the marsh and you can see it all along the edge of the marsh here so this this floats along up at high tide so that again is called detritus so interesting find there oh Sandra's got one of my favorites food for animals this is actually a plant that some people actually eat so food for people and this is called glasswort, and it's also called pickerel weed because it's salty. How this plant adapts to living in salt water is that it has these cells. When it takes in the salt water, it actually takes the salt water out of the um, the salt out of the water and stores it in its leaves. And that's why the leaves are real, real um, spongy. And so they hold that. Yeah, you eat a piece. I'll, I'll eat a piece for the camera. <laughs>
What's it taste like? Salt. Salty. Like salt. Yeah, and that's what some people call a pickerel weed. Some people There's, really like it. Yeah, <laughs> they really do. They really do like it. If you ever see one of these, you got to look real close and you'll see like these little tiny little leaves on it. And that's another way that it lives in the air to make sure that it doesn't lose the precious fresh water that it does um, extract from the salt water. Another cool thing about it, as you'll notice, is that see how part of this is turning red? Right before they die, they start in the, uh, this time of year, they start turning red. And so by the end of the, their life, this plant is mostly all red and then it dies. So it's one of the cool things that they do. It probably has something to do with the salt water. Ooh, Sandra's got another really neat plant of the marsh. This is called a black needle rush. And this is the entire plant, the stem and um, on it. This is, um, you find this one, we don't have it out here uh, because this plant is not as good as Spartina is taking all of the salt out of the water. So usually you'll find this closer to like the, the tree line um, because as you get closer to the uplands here, actually you start getting salt, fresh water coming in from the drainage from the um, uplands into the salt water. So when you get the, the marsh close to the upland is usually not as saline as it is when, out by the poles. So this is where you usually will find this plant growing. And it is called black needle rush, needle Ooh, rush mainly because <laughs> you just it's, yes, it's that to myself. It's got a point at the end. It's, and um, so cool if you down. see this out there, Feel never, that. if you walk out in the, the needle rush, do not look down because you may um, poke your eye out with the top of that. This one I just broke it, but um, for something as delicate as your eye, it, yeah, it can cause some damage. This plant here is green right now. The beginning at this time of the year is green, but as the year goes on, it actually turns black, and that's why they call it black needle rush. Um, if you wanted to eat it, could you um, cut the point off and eat it? Eat the I round part? don't know if you can eat this. So the, the, what I would say as a rule when you have a plant, do not eat it until you <laughs> talk to a botanist to tell you because some plants are poisonous. There's actually they would one of them, yes, and it can't can hurt. Just like mushrooms, you know, that mm -hmm. there's like tell you don't eat mushrooms. The same thing for these plants. Even though you ate that salicornia, that's because we know mm -hmm. that it is something you can't eat. But as a rule, don't do that. That's a good point to make. <laughs> as we were talking about zonation, as I mentioned before, what the marsh close to the uplands usually have a lower salinity. So plants that really don't can't cope with all that salt water, this is where you find them. And at the edge of the marsh, right inside a transition zone between the uplands and the marsh, you have another wetland community called a salt shrub thicket. And the plants that are in there are all your, your woody species. And interesting, I want to show you this, is that from a glance you would think that this is one of your, your herbs, but it's not. This is actually another shrub, shrubby plant because shrubby plants are basically is plants that develop like a woody coating on their stems and this branches. And this is called sea oxide. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, it's actually in the daisy family. And you can see the beautiful yellow flower that's on it. And how this plant adapts is that it also can take the salt water out and it's a, a fleshy plant. And usually plants that live in the marsh are usually fleshy mm -hmm. because they have a lot of air spaces where they can like store the salt water. And this one too, you can see like the salt will be on it, will come out of it. You know, we focus so much on the animals and things in the marsh that it's neat to get a perspective yeah. on some of the other important things out here. Well, you need the plants for the animals. Right, we need the plants for yes, the animals. Yes, definitely, <laughs> because they do provide cover. It's also a great nursery habitat for our small fish and everything, so it is very important. You can't have one without the other.